Second example, this one a little more personal. Uh, one of my great former students, who's actually um, in, in, in the earliest years that I was at ITP, um, and became obsessed with Friendster when it launched, and actually ended up doing her, uh, her master's thesis on a comparison of Friendster, MySpace, and uh, Meetup, uh, has gone on to become a good friend and colleague. And last fall, she and her fiance separated, right? which is obviously a tragedy, but of interest only to a small group of friends. You can see where this is going. Uh, <laughs> In addition to all the difficulties of managing that kind of problem, she now also has to go through the 21st century ritual, the changing of the relationship status. Right? You have to go to your social network, wherever it is, and you have to take the checkbox, and you have to move it from engaged to single. Right? She's a Facebook user. And the problem, of course, is that the concept of friend on Facebook has become so completely debauched that it's a person I met in a bar, somebody I went to school with five years ago, and so forth and so on. Even harder for her, because, of course, when you're engaged for a long time, your social networks condense. Many of her, the friends on her list were really her former fiancé's friends. And she certainly didn't want to be telling them in this way. <laughs> Facebook famously has a news feed, right? And the news feed is, you know, oh, Clay just linked to so-and-so. Linda just joined such and such a group. All of these kinds of things. You don't want to find out, right? Oh, these two people aren't engaged anymore. And, right, Clay just joined the Ryerson Chemistry Group. It's not the kind of information you want broadcast widely, particularly if you're going to upset your former fiancé's friends. So, Facebook to the rescue. Facebook actually has an incredibly well-written privacy policy. And it's linked to from every page because they get that these kinds of problems are something they have to get right. And they have a really clear privacy panel. Here's where you can manage all of your preferences, check this to make sure that thing happens, uncheck that box and this other thing won't happen, and so forth. And so my friend went in, she read the privacy policy, she read this, she double-checked her work, and then she took the momentous step, engaged, single. Less than one second later, every single person on her contact list got that information. And many of those people were her former fiancé's friends who also got it. And the panic calls and emails and IMs began pouring in from all over. My God, what happened? What happened? Right. Total privacy disaster. Complete wipeout. Right. She never did figure out what she did wrong. But the two easy excuses, she's dumb, Facebook doesn't do it right, neither of those work here, right? She did her master's thesis on Facebook, right? This is not a newbie, right? And James Grimmelman, who writes about privacy at New York Law School, says from his review, Facebook has the single best, single most clearly stated and enacted privacy policy of any social networking site he's reviewed. The problem is, we're no good at this, right? The problem is that privacy used to be enforced by inconvenience, right? Having to take a checkbox and say, this is who I want to know I just got engaged or unengaged from, it's just not something we're good at, right? And machines are so dumb that you have to speak to them like they're small children. I want you to tell these people, but not those people, right? And Privacy has never worked that way. Right? We've had a conversation, we are having a conversation right now which is, assumes a kind of dichotomy. There is private and there is public. Right? And all you have to do is decide where do things go. Do they go in the private bucket or do they go in the public bucket? Right? But that's not right. Because between private and public there used to be something called personal. A word we now use only to refer to technology. But it used to refer to us, right? I could walk through the park and have a conversation with people. And yes, I was in public. And yes, I could be overheard. But it wasn't like anybody was recording every word I said and then preserving it for all time. Except now it is like that. It's exactly like that online. And so what we're seeing, in fact, is that the principal guarantor of not being spied on wasn't rights or regulations or rules. It was that it was a hassle and expensive, right? 
In the 20th century, the privacy regime basically had two components, right? If the government was interested, they had a small group of people and they would gather an enormous amount of information on each person, right? And if commerce was interested, right, they don't want to know what Mary Beth in Iowa City thinks. They want to know what teen girls think. They want to know what middle-aged men think. So they gathered a thin slice of information across a huge range of people, right? But between those two things, right, the news that you just broke up from your fiancé wasn't included. And now it is, right? The privacy conversation is another example, I think, of this isn't a matter of deciding, well, we used to do it this one way, and now we're going to do it this other way. We didn't used to have to worry about it too much just because the real world was inconvenient enough to give us this personal space between either it goes in the private bucket or it goes in the public bucket. And the conversation we're having now isn't about how do we update our attitude towards privacy. It's about how do we have one. Because with the loss of inconvenience, all of the value that these social tools are bringing us, of, uh, which, which is incredible, I think transforming, right, nevertheless put us in this position of having to do by design stuff that we used to just get as a side effect of the environment. A society that has an internet is a different kind of society than a society that doesn't, in the same way that a society has a printing press. It's a different kind of society than a society that doesn't. And figuring out the forms that we want this to take is, is part of the job of this, of this historical generation. Now, as I said, this is speculative. I don't know what to do about this. <laughs> uh, but one, one parallel has struck me. It's a little grandiose, but it's whatever. I will, I, will, I will offer it up with that caveat. Between the American Revolution and the overthrow of Napoleon, all of the governments of the West, most of the governments of the West, were pitched into a conversation about how do we have a country, right? Who is a citizen? Who gets to decide? Who gets to lead? How do leaders get in? How do leaders get out? All of that stuff had largely been ratified by tradition, and suddenly it was up for grabs, right? And the amount of work that went into work figuring that out transformed, transformed the world in those years. We're having a similar conversation now. We are, are, I think, at the beginning of a similar conversation now about social life. How do we do this in a world where a study group suddenly isn't just a thing that everybody takes for granted anymore because it completely reorganizes two of the core values of the academy? Right? How do we do this? when having a personal tragedy suddenly puts you in the position of managing a console of your friends, right? We don't know, right? Some of it's we're just going to evolve our way into it. Some of it's we're going to have these conversations. We're going to do a lot of both. Um, but that, I think, uh, is the challenge that this stuff leaves us with. Once social life becomes mediated, it is in the hands of machines that have a hard time with subtlety. Right? And so the old, the old world where gossip spreads slowly has now been replaced by a world where it spreads instantly uh, and, and, and to the public at large. And grappling with those kinds of questions, I think, is going to be a big part of this transition.